light within our hearts, light within our minds, light within our words. We want it all and everything, blessed and loved ever be. Welcome. I am Sister Who. With me today on the show, I have my friend Maureen Megan, and we were having a discussion the other day and, and came up with what sounds like a very simple topic, but it's it's actually more multifaceted than people might think, uh, and that was beauty and the human soul. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, there's some sort of connection between beauty and the soul, uh, by whatever description you want to give the soul. Beauty seems to be part, somehow we're tied into our consciousness also, that there's something about the appreciation of beauty, or the desire to control beauty. All of the above. I think that the human soul recognizes beauty, and we're talking about beauty in the sense of, as as you've said before, the sense of awe, beauty that inspires awe, that's transcendent, not not beauty of uh, a particular style or fashion or. Yeah, the difference between beauty and beauty. Beauty. Mm -hmm. beauty. To where you're just open mouth and, and you don't even have a word to describe it. The, the beauty that poets can, can Which describe. Which is interesting, what comes to mind is, as we said that just now, that experience of awe, that's also something I equate to experiences of God. Mm -hmm. That even the atheist who, I don't know, maybe looking at a photograph from the Hubble telescope or something, is just speechless in awe. I think on some level there's something of touching God in that experience. It, I think beauty reminds you of a divine, that there is a divine presence, mm -hmm. that there is something much larger than ourselves. And I, and I also think that beauty... And quite possibly much more mysterious. Much more mysterious, but I think it also connects us to truth, mm -hmm. that um, those, tr I don't know if transcendental is the right word, but those... Those big transcendent? truths, transcendent truths, the yeah. truth that is large. I mean, so often God has been depicted in anthropomorphic terms, uh, having mm. human qualities. Um, and I suppose God may very well include all of our human qualities, but I can't imagine that God is limited to our human qualities. You know, that God includes everything we identify as human and a million times more. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for me, the simplest way to um, describe or reference God, I suppose, is to say the embodiment of greatest wisdom and greatest love, um, which, of course, is only you know, half a step off from being greatest truth also. Mm -hmm. And so there's a sense in which when you, when you encounter great truth, great beauty, great love, great wisdom, it's hard to find any one of the four without finding the other three. Oh, I think that's true. Um, they seem to all travel in, in a bunch. And, and at that point, how do you have that without having some sort of consciousness? But it may not resemble the humanoid consciousness that most churches describe. Mm -hmm. it's it may not have gender, right? as we understand gender. It may not have age. Uh, as we understand age, it may be a consciousness outside of time. Uh, I was just thinking earlier this morning about some of the shows we've done in the past, where I spent a whole show at one point talking about the question, the question word when, and <laughs> understanding that you cannot ask the question word when without presuming linear time. Right. Because there's no such thing as when unless you have a before and an after. Right. And so for a person or a consciousness that lives outside of the dimension of time, the question when could be untranslatable. It, it could, and sometimes I do communicate with a consciousness that's outside of time, and if I ask when, I get these soon. It, it's, it, like, it's already here soon, but it doesn't mean anything, because soon, I, with a being outside of time, has no meaning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As soon as relatives. So. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You know, and beauty in the human soul. I, I coming back to our topic, mm -hmm. I, I was trying to 
defined soul once for a person who um, was a more atheistic scientific perspective. Mm -hmm. And I said, my speculation, which at this point is pure speculation, is that if we ever succeed in mapping the human brain, mm -hmm. which is so complex, we're not even close, um, you know, and thoroughly, thoroughly mapping the human brain and understanding each part, the soul will be identified as that part of the human brain through which the paranormal most often communicates. I'm, and I would even say that this, uh, so there's all this scientific evidence now about the, um, the neural synapses of the heart, the um, neuroplasticity of the heart, that the heart has as many neuro neurological connections uh, almost as the brain, and that it communicates first to the brain before the brain communicates. Okay. And, um, and it's, it's always been my belief that, that this is why we have feelings in our heart, or we say our heart is breaking, or... Um, or think with your heart. Think with your heart, or follow your heart, and so... So there may be a sense in which the heart is part brain. Yes. Well, yes. on a similar note, I read a wonderful book by Elaine de Beauport called Three Faces of Mind, where she, s she describes ten different ways that the body stores intelligence, mm -hmm. many of which are not located in the brain. Yeah. Uh, but ten different kinds of intelligence, and how, and th the book is wonderful in that it goes on to describe how you can develop those intelligences, uh, you know, if you actually want to work on yourself and, and empower yourself. And, and it's very grounded, I mean, it's not some weird, wacky, channeled, out there sort of thing that you have to have a lot of faith or or, or start doing things or your neighbor's going to look at you funny. Mm -hmm. It's all very common sense, down to earth sort of things. So I, getting back to the human soul, I, I, would, I would suggest to some scientific person to, to go to the heart, to think mm -hmm. about the heart and how do you, you cannot scientifically explain what the heart feels, that it is, but if you feel, then you know it's feeling. It it it's, it mm -hmm. happens. Well, and there's a lot of things like uh, like this, the perception of the transcendent, you might say, or mm -hmm. perception of the spiritual, that you really don't have to go outside of common sense to access. Um, I mean, virtually everyone has an experience of being at a party and somebody walks into the room and they just look over and relative without even having a conversation with that person. They mentioned to someone saying next to them, that person gives me the creeps. Right. Uh, or, or I feel really safe in your when when you're around. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel really safe when you're around. That, to me, I mean, it's nothing like I saw a ghost or what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, not, not uh, devaluing those experiences, but saying, for all those people in the middle of society's mental emotional evolution mm -hmm. you know common everyday people who maybe aren't totally sold on paranormal stuff mm -hmm. it's still well within reach right uh, just op just be open to the possibility and allow that integration of beauty in the soul to teach you and develop you as life goes on or the the need to be around some people really need to be an outdoor or a na nature space. Mm -hmm. That it's that connection, you know, whether you call it that or not, but it's that connection with beauty and how that beauty feeds you. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that your soul requires that beauty. Well, and that's going on to the next step of beauty existing not only for a pragmatic reason, but having a pragmatic, a practical application that beauty isn't just its own reward, like it's beautiful so that's all it needs to be, mm -hmm. but it's beautiful and at the same time it empowers me to think in new ways, to try new things, to believe that I might be able to do something that I didn't previously think I could do. Um, it might inspire me to visit a place I'd never considered visiting before, uh, or to read a book I hadn't considered reading before. And the idea that you share a, a space, a place, uh, a connection 
with this with that degree of beauty I think is also that you know that reminds you that that there's more to you than perhaps you think there is that if, if you can reach out and and have this experience well in that sense making room in your life for more of your own beauty uh, making room in your life for the beauty of others and making room in your life for the beauty of that which is beyond you mm -hmm. the mysterious transcendent whatever um, that there's um, well this is a really 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 basic example that would seem would seem to be disconnected I suppose uh, someone who says they want a new uh, spouse or, or boyfriend or lover in their lives and they live in a nice house and everything's all perfectly arranged and whatnot and you go into their house and you look around and they say well here's my bedroom and here's my office and here's the living room and and I look at them and say so where are you gonna put your lover mm -hmm. you don't have a single empty closet you don't have a room for your lover's office if your lover needs an office you you know whatever hobbies or interests or whatever your desired spouse would have where are you going to put them you'll have to sell the house and move somewhere else um, you know in a similar sort of way when you're talking about beauty in the human soul what are we leaving room for and if we don't leave room for it how is it ever supposed to get in so do you do you think that we consciously or unconsciously may not be leaving room for beauty I think um, I think usually unconsciously we're not uh, we're usually not creating space for what we say we want to happen in our lives um, and because what we want isn't physically present or visible we're inclined to not notice that we are leaving no room for it I mean if I had uh, a, if somebody gave me a new car and it was parked out on the street in front of my house until such time as I could find room for it in my driveway that would serve as a reminder that I need to create space if I say I want uh, a new car in addition to the house for whatever reason or something um, if I say I want an exercise room but mm -hmm. there's no room in the house that I can turn into an exercise room the first thing pragmatically would be to figure out where you're gonna put it but when it comes to beauty how often do we challenge ourselves with the question where would I put more beauty if I had it Right. <laughs> Um, how would it need to be cared for? Um, mm -hmm. I've seen uh, statuary, for example, uh, on occasion that I, that struck me as very beautiful, but I have no place in my house where I could display it. Mm -hmm. So it stays in the museum or the store or wherever I saw it. Um, I've seen people with beautiful gardens, and I would love to have a beautiful garden like that. Well, where would I put it? well if I give up this corner of the yard maybe or if I where would I put it mm -hmm. um, so th I guess to me when we talk about beauty in the human soul the challenge is to go beyond mere observation into involvement and participation that the human soul expands by contact with beauty and that consequently you need to give your soul somewhere to be other than inside a, a bottle with a cork on the top right or inside of a box when you talk about putting people in a box um, maybe the first thing to allowing the soul to be beautiful is to get it out of the box and set it on a big open table or someplace where it actually has the ability to expand and grow and beauty recognition of beauty by the soul is uh, there's feeling is involved in it and I think that I've just encountered so many people who are confused by feeling or don't understand feeling or block feeling 
or they're so wounded that uh, feelings are, are just scary. And I think that uh, another thing that, that beauty that feeds the soul does is um, it's such a lovely, soft, gentle, healing way to feel because when you experience true beauty, you can't help but feel and you can't help but be lifted by it and that it's, it's very healing to experience beauty. When you, well, and of course now we're speaking of true beauty. True beauty. When you, I think when people experience superficial beauty, it, number one, it doesn't change them. No. It, it's pretty, it's nice enough, but it doesn't change them, it doesn't, they don't feel the loss when they walk away from it. That sense of awe that you have yeah. spoken yeah, of. It, it's like the person who finds uh, various kinds of art beautiful and goes to the Louvre in Paris, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the fam most famous art museums in the world, and walks through it and walks out and thinks, oh, that was beautiful, and goes home, as opposed to the person who walks through and can't wait to come back tomorrow to look at it again, mm -hmm. and then comes back a week later to see even more and then maybe goes to a particular painting or statue and sits down and sits there for an hour contemplating what they're looking at because there's something about the beauty of that object that is speaking to them without words mm -hmm. and that to me needs to be part of the central definition of fine art that it calls us beyond ourselves that it engages us and makes us wonder and makes us reach for something beyond the horizon. Mm -hmm. That it incorporates beauty. That mm -hmm. beauty is in the experience of the art. And that beauty is an experience, not just an adjective. Yes. Or not just a, yeah, not just a descriptive. Um, in in terms of bringing this to the dailiness of our lives and spirituality, though. Mm -hmm. Seeing something beautiful, I mean, there's a dark side to it, too, that we really haven't touched much. Mm -hmm. um, you were mentioning in one of our earlier conversations how uh, the creation of beauty uh, is also sometimes mirrored by the destruction of beauty. Yes. Is it that the, is it wounded people um, venting their woundedness by destroying something beautiful? I think it, that there's the question then of, of wounded and then there's a question of some, something that's beyond wounded, something that that almost seeks to negate, which maybe you could say because of a woundedness. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think that there are those forces that exist that seek to negate beauty and truth. And I would say they are wounded, but they're not always aware that they're wounded. Yes, and, and the and, depth and of the wounding is and, and enormous. I think, as we said, sometimes the destruction of beauty is happening out of a desire to control or to take power that it is not wise to take. Yes, because if, if you're destroying beauty in the big sense, which is a, a path for people to transcend, to understand those bigger concepts we were talking about of, of truth and the divine, and uh, I think compassion is even in there, and that if they can, that's another thing, that if they could take beauty out, that it, you've just cut off one of those pathways to being more than, you know, understanding that you're more than this body, this, you know, mm -hmm. that, that life, that there's a joyousness, that there's a transcendence to life, that there is, uh, there's an immensity to life, there's, uh, uh, all possibilities exist in life, and... Is it possible for beauty to exist without relationship? Explain that a little more. There's an object that is considered beautiful. I can't even use the word considered without there being the reality of a relationship. Okay. 
I mean, it's almost like saying, does beauty exist if there's no one to consider it? Um, which sounds like, you know, somebody might say, well, that's an irrelevant philosophical question that runs in circles and doesn't mean anything. Yes and no. It, the, the point to me is that it comes back to relationship. Um, and relationships can be abusive or they can be empowering to the extent that we're able to, from our soul, regard another person as beautiful it seems to me that that could provoke us or prompt us to create an empowering, mutually beneficial relationship. And, and I will add that I think beauty does exist without us being aware of it because I put it with the divine. That if you're even okay. not aware of the divine, it's, in my opinion, it still exists. And, and beauty is so entwined with that mm. uh, that maybe they're so one and the same. it's not that it doesn't exist, it's waiting to be discovered. Waiting to be discovered, yes. Okay. Even with that, <laughs> waiting to be discovered, <laughs> we're back in the realm of relationship. If you're waiting to be discovered, you're waiting for interactive relationship. Um, so again, we're back to saying maybe we can't talk about beauty without invoking relationship. Maybe we can't, because that is how we we understand and because I don't understand without relationship I, mean, I can I can perhaps conceptualize that if, if I don't exist that doesn't mean something else doesn't exist mm -hmm. uh, but but for us to understand beauty we, we do have to have a relationship with it and for the experience of appreciation or awe or as we said of waiting to be discovered yes uh, I mean, even even the action of waiting assumes a relationship. Yes, it does. You you cannot describe yourself as waiting without being immediately dumped in the question of for what. Right. And when. For what? For when? Uh, for whom? Um, I mean, even if it's a relationship to another object uh, or to an object in time, um, waiting for judgment day or your whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but by reaching for it in a way that invites beauty or that um, not projects but is able to perceive beauty within another um, the common phrase of a face only a mother could love mm -hmm. um, the idea being that you find beauty in someone and it may not be physical beauty you're talking about. It may be a beauty of spirit, it may be a beauty of mind, it may be a beauty of relationship. You know, that there are some, uh, well, and I'm sure there's been a lot of paintings done over it too, the relationship between a mother and a newborn infant. Mm -hmm. The infant is not demonstrating any sort of interactive relationship at that point. And yet, as we look at the image of the relationship between the two, if there is a compassionate, nurturing, caring uh, feel to it, mm -hmm. uh, generally people call that beautiful. Right, right. Because it's, and, and that's another one of those qualities that that we seek, that, that helps us feel full, alive, to, to feel tended for and cared for. Whether you're doing that well, for yourself or it makes life worth living, yes. You know, and, and drawing from that, I guess, um, I mean, not everyone has a wonderful relationship with their mother, but certainly there are, are a hundred, a thousand other possible examples of a relationship that's happening that we call beautiful because it's somehow expanding both of the participants mm -hmm. or all the participants, depending on how many there are. Right. Um, the beautiful, if you'll allow me to describe it that way, uh, incident, uh, I think it happened two or three years ago, but it was some spontaneous, um, more or less spontaneous event in the Antwerp uh, train station where somebody started uh, playing over the loudspeakers a recording of uh, the song Do Re Mi from the movie mm. Sound of Music. And uh, obviously there were a few instigators and and people who snuck in and pretended to be members of the crowd and so forth, but 
but the point being that by the end of the song they had 90% of the people in the stadium dancing to this song in a public train station. Right. And it was positively beautiful. And for the most part, I think, I don't know, they were strangers to each other. Mm -hmm. um, but the opportunity was beautiful. The opportunity to get outside themselves, the opportunity to dance uh, in a public place to just let joy loose. To let joy loose. Oh, that is um, and, wonderful. And it created this communal event that brightened everyone's day, probably mm. everyone's week. And of course, went on was posted to the internet and has been seen by tens of thousands of people mm -hmm. ever since. Maybe hundreds of thousands by this point. Um, the idea that from our souls we can see the opportunity for, for beauty, grasp it, interact with it, participate in it, involve ourselves in it, put our whole soul into it, and expand our experience bigger than we could have ever done all on our own. Mm -hmm. And sense joy, touch mm -hmm. joy. We're almost completely out of time. Is there a final comment, you know, when we think of beauty in the human soul? Uh, I, The word that keeps coming back to me is expansive. Mm. You know, and, and that the two, beauty has to be expansive in order to continue to live, and the soul has to be expansive in order Absolutely. to continue to live. And that it's, there's happiness, that, that sense of lightness and happiness, too, that, that we need that also.